In this video, I'm going to cover titrations. So how do we know what the exact concentration of a solution is? Um, well, we can look on the bottle if we're looking at something that we're pulling out of a uh, chemical storage closet, for example. But if we created a solution, um, or the bottle is old, maybe, and it's been reacting with water or oxygen in the air, maybe the concentration is different than what it says on the bottle. Or um, if we just created the solution, maybe we don't have a bottle to look at. We don't have a label to look at. So how do we know what the exact concentration of a solution is? Well, one method is called a titration. And an acid-base titration is a quantitative analytical method that allows calculation of the concentration of analyte, which is just a really long way of saying that it's a way that we can use chemical reactions to measure the concentration of a solution so that we know exactly how much of a solute is dissolved in a solvent, for example. Um, the, an analyte is the compound in a solution that we are interested in measuring. So uh, generally when we're trying to measure the concentration of something in a solution, remember solutions are mixtures, so we have a solvent and a solute. And usually the solute is the analyte. Okay, so in an acid-base titration, a solution of known concentration, that's what we call the titrant. So that's a solution that we, we already know the exact concentration of that solution. That's slowly added to a solution of unknown concentration. That's the analyte. That's what we're trying to figure out what the concentration of the solution is. Um, it's slowly added to, a, uh, to the analyte from a burette until the reaction is complete. And a burette is just a piece of glassware that has uh, graduated measurements on it so you can easily read the exact uh, volume that's been dispensed from the burette. So when the reaction is complete and we've reached the endpoint of the titration, so that means that when I have the, according to the stoichiometry of the reaction, depending on how many moles of A I need to react with moles of B uh, when we look at a balanced chemical reaction. Um, when I've reached that, that equivalent, then we can say that we're at the end point. We have exactly as much A and B as we need to complete the reaction and make C or C and D or whatever the reaction might be. So an indicator may be added to determine the end point. And an indicator is another kind of chemical that changes colors when, uh, depending on certain um, uh, characteristics of the solution. In the case of an acid-base titration, that characteristic is generally pH. So the indicator is uh, something that changes color depending on what the pH of the solution is. So different indicators are different colors at different pHs. Um, when the moles of H3O plus equal the moles of OH minus, then the titration has reached its equivalence point. So the end point and the equivalence point are generally very close to each other, but they're not the exact same thing because the equivalence point is this theoretical moment right here when the moles, oops, when the moles of H3O plus and, and moles of OH minus are equal. Um, and reaching this exact moment and there's you remember moles is how many particles there are so when I and there's a lot of them so trillions and trillions and trillions of molecules molecules of H3O plus when I have the exact same number trillions and trillions of trillions down to one of OH minus molecules that's the equivalence point but you can imagine that in practice when you're doing a titration that's a pretty hard spot to hit exactly. So the end point is when you get really close to that equivalence point, but the end point is more uh, a quality, a characteristic of an experiment when you're doing that in the lab. You can't reach the equivalence point in the lab. It's, it's too hard, but you can reach the end point, which should be very, very close to the equivalence point. So if you, you see what I'm saying, this is a theoretical limit. And this is kind of a practical limit when you're actually doing it. So here's how a titration works. Um, the solution up here is called the titrant. And the titrant is generally a solution of known concentration. 
So when I'm doing an acid-base reaction, I either need an acid up here or a base up here. And the corresponding acid or base would be down here. So in this example, I have a base, that's my titrant. And down here, I have H+, which is an acid, that's my analyte. So the titrant, in this case, is OH-, sodium hydroxide, let's, let's say. Um, I know exactly what the concentration of sodium hydroxide up here is. Let's say it's 1.014 molar. So that's down to three decimal points. I know the exact concentration of this solution. That's really important when I'm trying to use a titration to determine what the concentration of this solution is. Because the titration is based on the fact that there's some number of molecules of OH- that are required to react with some number of molecules of H+, and when I have added just enough OH- uh, to this solution of H+, then OH- and H+, will be equal, which means there won't be, they'll be completely used up, right? OH- plus H+, plus makes water. So if I add 10 OH- molecules and 10 H+, plus molecules, then they would be exactly balanced and I would have actually 10 H2O molecules because they would react with each other and make H2O. That means I would have zero H plus and I would have zero OH minus in the solution. They would all be water. It would all have been converted to water. That would be the equivalence point. But again, if I've, I actually have five, right? One, two, three, four, five acid. The probability of me getting exactly five base molecules in there to match one, two, three, four, five of my acid so that I have exactly uh, an equal amount of H plus and OH minus is highly unlikely in the lab. So having five H plus and five OH minus is called the equivalence point. But in practice, I'm probably going to have five H plus down here and I'm going to get six OH minus in the flask. And remember, we're talking about 5 million trillion and 6 million trillion, for example. Or, you know, so having five particles is pretty unrealistic. But let's say that each one of these is actually equivalent to a trillion particles. So the, the likelihood that I would exactly match the number of base particles to the number of acid particles is pretty low. But I can reach the end point of the titration when they are almost equal. And if I've put in an appropriate indicator, which changes color at a certain pH, then it will change color right when I've reached that end point. Now here they're calling it the equivalence point. I think that, uh, that this um, PowerPoint that I'm borrowing from another source is using endpoint and equivalence point interchangeably. But when we're talking about performing an actual titration, we're reaching the end point of the titration which should hopefully be close to the theoretical equivalence point. And we can tell when we're getting close by adding an indicator, for example. So um, when we're doing this in the lab, the solution down here of acid is colorless when I've added the indicator. The indicator reacts at um, pH above 7. So when the pH becomes basic, Remember, 7 is neutral. Anything above 7 is basic. When the pH becomes basic, then the solution will turn pink. So when I have a solution of acid down here, a pH below 7, anything that's acidic is going to have a pH below 7. It will be acidic. So when it's acidic, the, the indicator hasn't changed color. It's colorless. But as I drip the base into the solution, every drip of base, see, I, I drip the base in there, and it turns kind of pink because where the base has added, that base is basic, and the indicator changes color with base. Eventually, that base that I'm adding from the burette up here will have reacted with all the acid, and all the acid will be gone when I've added a certain amount of base, right? And um, at that point, if I've added the right chemical indicator, it should the whole solution will change color. Now at that point, there's no acid left. I could keep adding base, and then I would just have base and more and more and more and more base, right? So the idea is I start with acid down here, I start with base up here, and as I add the base to the solution, eventually all the acid gets used up, I reach the equivalence point or the end point, and the solution changes color. And, that's, and then we can um, 
calculate what the exact concentration of this solution is down here that just changed color by figuring out how much of this solution I've used. Remember, this solution is of known concentration. I know exactly what the concentration is. And using this burette here, I know exactly what volume I've dispensed. So if I know exactly what the concentration is and exactly what volume I've dispensed, then I know exactly how many particles I've added to the solution. And if I know how many particles I've added to the solution, then I know how many particles of acid were in this one originally. So this is the idea in a titration. If I know how many of these particles I add and I don't know how many are in here, at some point I'll reach the equivalence point and then I'll know, okay, I added 1.5 times 10 to the 24 particles and then therefore there must be 1.5 times 10 to the 24 particles of acid down here because that, must be, that would be the equivalence point when moles of acid and moles of base are equal. A titration curve is a plot of pH values versus the amount of added titrant. So the inflection point of the curve is the equivalence point of the titration. Prior to the equivalence point, the known solution in the flask is in excess, so the pH is closest to its pH. So um, when we're looking at a titration curve, what we're doing is we're monitoring the pH of the, the solution uh, the analyte solution in this flask down here and as I add more base to the solution down here the pH starts changing so a titration curve is keeping track of the changing pH as I'm adding the titrant as I add the base so here's what a titration curve looks like where I start down here this is volume of sodium hydroxide Oops. Kind of hard to see my, my computer's cutting it off. So down here, volume of NaOH added in milliliters. That's this axis right here. When I have when I'm at zero, that means I have added zero milliliters of NaOH. So in my titration this is before the titration has started right here this means I'm only measuring the pH in the beaker and I haven't added any base yet zero mils of base so on this axis I have the pH so what's the pH when I've added zero mils of base the pH is equal to the pH of the acid that's in my beaker here my, uh, my analyte so I'm, I'm keeping track of the pH of the analyte and at the very beginning, before I've added any base, before this first molecule of base has been added, the pH that I'm keeping track of is the pH of this weak acid. So that's right here. It's about 1, right? Maybe a little bit more than 1, 1 1.2. So the pH of that weak acid before I start the titration is 1.2, pretty acidic. As I, start, as I add the first drop of base, the pH goes up a little. I had the second drop of base, and third, and, and fourth milliliter, and fifth milliliter, and so on. And then I've added 20 milliliters, and then 30 milliliters, and then 40 milliliters. You see the pH goes up because base is, has a high pH, and I'm adding base to the solution. And as I add base to the solution, it makes the pH go up. So it's going up slowly at first because I have a lot of acid. And when I add base and acid, they react. And I, have, I still have a lot of acid left over. I still have a lot of acid left over. I still have a lot of acid left over. And then something big happens. When the curve shoots up like this, I reach the equivalence point. And at the equivalence point, that's when all of the acid is gone. So remember, I'm starting here with 100% acid. And then I start adding base. There's less acid, less acid, less acid, 50% acid. Less acid, less acid, less acid, 0% acid. I've run out of acid. So the titration keeps going after that point. I keep adding base. I've added more base. All the acid is gone, but there's still more base in solution. Now I've added 60 mils of base, 70 mils of base, 80 mils of base. And the titration curve would keep going, and the pH would keep going up because base is basic. It has a high pH.
So this is how we read a titration curve. Um, it starts off low for if we're titrating an acid, and then as we add base, the pH goes up. This is called the inflection point. This is the point in the titration curve when acid and base are equal, the equivalence point. So this is um, when I've run out of acid, or when I've added the amount of base that was equal to the amount of acid that I started with. So acid and base are equal at the equivalence point. If I'm titrating a strong base, the titration curve looks the same, it's just backwards. So if I'm starting with a strong base, then it has a very high pH, because remember, strong bases have high pH, and strong acids have low pH, right? So if I'm starting with a strong base as my analyte, and that's what I'm titrating, I'm trying to figure out what's the concentration of my strong base here, then the pH is initially going to be very high. As I start adding strong acid of known concentration, the pH goes down, 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 and here I have 0% base. And I keep adding acid until I get to the pH of just the strong acid, a high concentration of strong acid. So you can see that the uh, the shapes of the titration curves for strong acids and strong bases versus titrating a strong base with a strong acid are the same shape, they're just inverted. Because when I start with an acid, my pH starts low. But when I'm, oops, but when I'm titrating a base, my pH starts high. So um, when we're titrating strong acids and strong bases, what we're left with at the end is um, two salts that are completely neutral. So strong acids and strong bases generally have a uh, equivalence point at exactly seven. So let's look at why that is for just a minute here. HCl plus NaOH. That's a strong acid and a strong base, right? What happens when they react? I make NaCl plus H2O. So remember, H2O has, has a pH of 7. It's neutral. And when I'm looking at a salt, and I'm trying to figure out, is a salt acidic, basic, or neutral? Remember that there's a couple of rules. And the rules are that cations are generally neutral. Sodium plus is neutral. So this is has a pH of 7. And when I look at anions, anions are usually basic. Almost everything that has a negative charge is basic when it's in water. There's six exceptions to that rule, and they are the six conjugate bases of strong acids. So HCl is a strong acid. So Cl minus is a neutral anion. So if the cation Na plus is neutral and the anion Cl minus is neutral, then this whole salt is neutral. And this salt happens to be table salt. Um, so salt and water, this has a pH of 7. And it's not just HCl and NaOH that give us something that's neutral and something that's neutral. Any strong acid plus any strong base is always going to give us a neutral salt plus water. Therefore, any strong acid and any strong base that I titrate together will always have an equivalence point with a pH that's at 7 because they'll always be neutral, a neutral salt and neutral water, which is, always has a neutral pH of 7. So it doesn't matter what strong acid... Oops. It doesn't matter what strong acid HCl has an equivalence point of 7 or what strong base and AOH has an equivalence point of 7. If I had HBr plus KOH, it would also have an equivalence point of 7. If I had H2SO4 plus magnesium hydroxide, it would also have an equivalence point of 7 because that's a strong acid and a strong base. So strong acids and strong bases always have equivalence points of 7. But weak acids and weak bases, when they're being titrated, generally do not have equivalence points of 7. And the reason is that when I look at, uh, if I replace this here 
to replace the strong acid with a weak acid. HCl is a strong acid. HF is a weak acid. So if HF is a weak acid, then what do I have after I've neutralized HF? I have sodium fluoride and water. Water is neutral. Na plus is neutral. But F minus is not neutral. F minus is basic. Because remember, anions are almost always basic unless they are the conjugate bases of strong acids. So F minus is basic. Therefore, a solution of sodium fluoride is basic. So if I'm titrating a weak base, then my, what I'm left over with is going to be a weak acid. It's going to have a pH that's less than 7. And if I'm titrating a weak acid, what I'm left over, what's left over is going to be a weak base, and it's going to have an equivalence point that's higher than 7. So the way to look at this is after these two have completely reacted, this is, for example, the titrant and the analyte. After this reaction is completed, what do I have left? I have a solution of this. And what is this? Well, in this case, in, in, case, in all acid-base reactions, I'll always have water, and then I'll have some salt. Is that salt going to be acidic, basic, or neutral? That's going to determine where the equivalence point is on my titration curve. Is it at 7, above 7, or below 7? So when I have a weak acid in my titration curve, then this is the volume of base, right? Because I'm titrating a weak acid, and this is the pH. I'll start with the weak acid. It's going to have a low pH because it's an acid, right? And so when I titrate a weak acid with a strong base, it's going to uh, have a shape like this, where it goes up a little bit. I'm adding base, adding more base, and then it has this inflection point, and then all the acid has run out, and now I'm just adding more base. And here we can say right here in the middle of this steep part, that's the equivalence point. Now when I'm talking about a weak acid, I'm talking about HF, for example, plus a strong base. And this is going to make sodium fluoride plus water. So at the equivalence point, that means that I have exactly the same amount of HF and NaOH. That means that HF and NaOH have completely reacted with each other. So they're not in solution anymore. At the equivalence point, the only thing I have in solution is NaF and H2O. NaF is basic because F- is basic. So that means that this equivalence point when I'm titrating a weak acid with a strong base, this equivalence point is going to be above 7, let's say 8. Somewhere above 7, because it's going to be basic because sodium fluoride is a basic salt. Uh, here we're using NH3. So this is a weak base. NH3, oops. NH3, my weak base. Remember, strong bases have OH minus, and uh, any compound that has a lone pair, particularly nitrogen-containing compounds, are weak bases. So NH3, nitrogen, has a weak base, um, plus a strong acid. They don't say which one. Let's just say HCl. That's a strong acid. So what happens when I mix this weak base and this strong acid? I get N. H4 plus, right, because the weak base is going to take the H from the strong acid, and the strong acid is going to donate the H, so it becomes Cl minus. So when I'm at the equivalence point of this titration, where I have, I'm titrating NH3 and HCl, at the equivalence point, this and this are gone. They're completely used up because I had 10 molecules of this, I had 10 molecules of this, 
So that means that they've reacted with each other, and I really have 10 molecules of this and 10 molecules of this, and zero of these at the equivalence point. So is this at the equivalence point, is this neutral or acidic or basic? Well, I have to look at what these salts. So here I have Cl minus, which is the conjugate base of a strong acid. I know that this is neutral. This is one of those six anions that is not basic. Remember, most anions are basic. NH4 plus. Most cations are neutral, but this one in particular is not neutral. NH4 plus ammonium is actually an acid. If it was a weak base before and it, don and it accepts an H plus, now it has an H plus that it can donate. So NH4 plus is actually an acid. It can donate an H plus, and then it will become NH3. So this is acidic. So when I have, when I treat a weak base with a strong acid, what I get is something that's acidic and something that's neutral. So here, this is going to be an acidic solution. So the acidic solution is going to have a pH that's less than 7, 5.26 in this case. Finally, when we're looking at um, a weak acid being titrated by a strong base, we have a curve that looks a bit like this. So again, on this axis, we have the volume of titrant. The titrant in this case is NaOH, of which we would know the exact concentration. And we're titrating a solution of HF. So this point right here would correspond to the pH of the solution of HF. Let's say it's a one molar solution of HF. So this spot right here, right before we've added any titrant, would correspond to the pH of a, of a one molar solution of HF. And I start adding base. Notice that the shape of the curve, the pH starts changing relatively quickly. So when I add the first bits of strong base, the pH goes up pretty quick. But then the pH starts to change much more slowly. In fact, as I add lots of base, look how much base I've added right here. The pH has hardly changed at all. So remember when I have a solution that resists changes to pH where the pH is hardly changing at all, we call that a buffer. So when you think about it, when I start my uh, titration right here, the solution only has HF in it. So it only has weak acid. There's no weak base. When it only has weak acid, it's not a buffer. So a solution that's not a buffer cannot resist changes to pH very well. So when I have a solution of only HF, when I start adding strong base, it can't resist changes to pH very well. It's not a buffer. And so the pH goes up pretty quick. But then somehow the pH stops changing as if now it is a buffer. So how is it that I start with something that isn't a buffer and then it becomes a buffer? Well, remember that a buffer is just a solution of weak acid and its conjugate base. What happens to the HF in this solution as I start adding sodium hydroxide? It turns into sodium fluoride, right? So if I have a solution of just HF, and I add NaOH to it, well, HF plus NaOH makes NaF. HF and NaF are a conjugate acid-base pair. Here's an acid-base pair. The more NaOH I add to the solution, the more NaF I create. Eventually, I have so much NaF that it's getting equal to the amount of HF I have. In fact, right here at the half equivalence point, NaF and HF are equal, right in the middle of my buffer region. So right here, I have a very strong buffer. HF and NaF are equal. Weak acid, it's conjugate base, significant amounts, and equal amounts. This is the maximum buffering capacity of my buffer right here at the half equivalence point. So half equivalence point, moles, of HA equal moles of A minus at my half equivalence point. That's what's equal HA and A minus.
have a very good buffer. How do I know what the pH is at the half equivalence point? Well, let's look at the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. pH equals pKa plus log of base over acid. If base and acid are equal, base being A minus, acid being HA, if those are equal, because I'm at the half equivalence point, then this is the log of 1. The log of 1 is equal to 0. So at the half equivalence point, pH equals pKa. So it's very easy to calculate the pH at the half equivalence point of a titration. It's equal to pKa. You don't really have to calculate anything. You just look it up in a table. pH equals pKa at the half equivalence point. So I keep adding base, keep adding base. I'm using up that weak acid, right? As I add strong base, the weak acid's getting used up. Eventually, the pH starts going way up fast. Because I've used up so much weak acid, I don't have enough weak acid anymore for this to be a buffer. Down here, I didn't have enough weak base for this to be a buffer. But up here, I don't have enough weak acid for this to be a buffer. So now it's not a buffer anymore. I've left the buffer region. I keep adding weak base, keep adding weak base right here. All the weak acid is gone. The full equivalence point. So at the full equivalence point, what's equal at the full equivalence point? The moles of HA are equal to the moles of OH minus. So the half equivalence point and the full equivalence point are similar. The half equivalence point, half of the HA has been used up. Half of the HA has been converted to A minus, so HA and A minus are equal, because half of this got turned into this. At the full equivalence point, all of this is gone. All of this has now been converted into this. So that means that HA and OH minus are equal, my titrant, whatever my titrant is. So it's a subtle difference, but it's a very important difference. Here I still have half of my HA left. Here I don't have any of my HA left. It's all gone, the full equivalence point. So how do I figure out the pH at this point? This is the pH of a weak acid. I need ice table. That's really the only way to figure out what the pH of a weak acid is. Ice table. Here, what's the pH? pH equals pKa. Here, what's the pH? This is since moles of HA equals moles of OH minus, that means HA and OH minus are gone. So what's left at the full equivalence point? Only this and this. The pH of water is 7. So to figure out the pH of the solution, I need to know the pH of this. So at the full equivalence point, the pH is the pH of weak base. And weak by weak base, I mean A minus. So I need an ice table to figure that out. So depending on where we are in the titration, I figure I can calculate the pH of that solution differently. To figure out the pH of a weak acid, to figure out the pH of HA, I need an ice table. When I have a buffer, the calculations are easy. I can use the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. And in fact, when I'm at the half equivalence point, the calculation is so easy, it's just pH equals pKa. And now when I don't have a buffer, the calculation's hard again. Now I have just a weak base. To find the pH of a weak base, I need to use an ice table with Kb. And then as I keep going, now I have weak base and strong base. Here, when I reach this point, to figure out the pH, I would figure out how much strong base do I have in solution. The pH is a function of how much strong base, because the strong base is affecting the pH more than the weak base is at this point in the titration.
So what about polyprotic acids? Remember, these are acids that have more than one um, acidic proton. So like H2SO4 or H2SO3 or H3PO4 or any acid that has more than one acidic H, right? Well, if I can titrate that first acidic H and the titration curve has a shape that looks kind of like this, if it has a second acidic H, it's just going to have a second titration curve added on that has kind of the same shape. So um, polyprotic acids have titration curves that have more than one equivalence point because each equivalence point is the point at which that um, one equivalent of acid is equal to base. So if I have more than one ac acidic proton, then I'll have an equivalence point where the first proton has been taken off completely, and then I'll have a second equivalence point where the second proton has been taken off completely. And if there was a third, I'd have another equivalence point, a third equivalence point where the third proton was, was taken off completely. So by taking off, taking off of the acid, remember what I mean is by adding base, because the base is going to take that H off of the acid. So when I've added enough base to the solution, then the base will have taken off all the H's, or it will have taken off the first equivalent, and then the second equivalent, and then the third equivalent, and so on. So um, if, when we're, when we're doing this in practice, right, that, that's theoretically, but when we're doing this in practice, and I'm actually trying to create an equivalence point for certain um, polyprotic acids, actually measuring these equivalence points becomes harder. And if Ka1, so if the first acidic proton is much, much, much more acidic than the next proton, then it will be easy for us to see two equivalence points in the titration. But if the first and second proton, or the second and third, for example, are pretty close to each other in acidity, then it's very difficult for us to, be, to see the second and third or the first and second equivalence point. So in practice, it's harder to measure polyprotic equivalence points. In theory, they're there, um, but when the difference in acidity between those protons is very big, it's easier to measure. When the difference in acidity is small, it's harder to measure those equivalence points. So again, when we're, when we're performing a titration, generally um, we want to measure the pH of the analyte. So we've got a we need some way of keeping track of the pH so that we can construct a pH curve. So the easiest way to do this is to use a pH monitor. Um, it's a probe that you just put into the uh, beaker of weak acid or weak base, whatever it is that you're titrating, and it has a digital readout that tells you what the pH is. You add a milliliter of base, the pH changes, you write it down. You add another milliliter of base, the pH changes, you write it down, and so on and so on and so on and so on, and you get all of the pH values that you need to create a titration curve. Um, and so when we're, that's, using this pH probe is one way to monitor the pH. Um, if you don't have a pH probe, then you can at least find the endpoint of the titration by using an indicator, an appropriate indicator. And by appropriate, I mean one that's going to change color near the equivalence point. So if you're titrating a strong acid and a strong base, the equivalence point is going to be around 7. So you would want an indicator that changes color around a pH of 7. But if you're um, uh, titrating a weak acid and a strong base, then you're going to want uh, something with, uh, that changes color above 7, because what you'll have left over is a weak base after you titrate that weak acid. So picking an appropriate indicator is just a matter of determining what the pH is going to be at the equivalence point and finding a, an indicator that changes color around that pH. So here's an example of using a pH probe in the analyte. Here's the titrant of known solution um, and your analyte down here of unknown solution and you have a pH probe in there that keeps track of the pH as you add a mil or two mils, every drop of base that you add, the pH is going to change, and it can maybe even digitally create this titration curve for you. So um, 
what these indicators are, these chemical indicators, they're dyes that change color depending on the pH of the solution. So you can even create um, a universal pH indicator by boiling red cabbage. If uh, you have some some cabbage, you know, you find it at the produce, it looks like, you know, a, a head of lettuce that's red. If you boil some of that red cabbage for a while, you get a juice that's kind of purple. Um, that purple juice has um, anthocyanins in it that change color depending on the pH of the solution. So you can add acids and bases to that kind of purplish water and it will turn yellow and it will turn blue and it will turn orange and red and green and all the different colors of the rainbow depending on what the pH is. So indicators are just different com um, chemical compounds whose color depends on the pH of the solution. So um, for example, uh, if we have uh, an indicator that's a weak acid, then we can say that a weak acid has an extra H to give up, right? So when it's reacting with water, it donates its H, and then we are left with um, some H3O+. So this is an important consideration to think about, is when we're uh, performing a titration, we're trying to, for example, see how much H3O plus there is in the analyte solution. But if I add an indicator, I'm adding more H3O plus. So when I'm trying to be very, very precise, and I'm trying to measure the exact concentration of that solution, I have to account for the fact that when I add one or two or three drops of indicator, I'm adding extra H3O plus that's going to add to my initial or my calculation, my final calculation, um, when I'm trying to determine how much H3O plus was in that initial weak acid solution. So the color of the solution at that point is going to depend on the relative concentration of the weak base, the conjugate base, to the weak acid indicator with the H on it. So um, when they're about equal, then the color of the solution will be a mix of the colors of the weak base and the weak acid. When there's more, uh, when there's more um, weak acid, then, or excuse me, when there's more weak base, then the color of the solution will be mostly the color of weak base. And when there's more weak acid, the color of the solution will be mostly the color of the weak acid. So generally, the, in this case, this is only this is one color and this is another color. So the color of the solution is going to depend on the concentration of this versus this. Other um, chemical indicators have more than just two colors, where depending on the exact amount of uh, of um, protons or H plus or weak acid that's in solution, um, one indicator can change for example, the entire rainbow of colors. Other indicators only have one or two colors where the solution is either um, colorless or pink, or the solution is either blue or green. But some indicators can go through an entire range of colors, and one indicator can, again, turn, turn maybe the, all of the colors of the rainbow. Phenolphthalein is an example of a chemical indicator that um, only has um, two colors, or maybe you could say three colors if you look down here. It's colorless before um, it, before the solution becomes basic. At a, so at a pH of 9, it turns slightly pink. And when it becomes very basic, at 10, it, so it turns very dark pink. So um, this indicator, it looks like this. And depending on how much acid or base there is in solution, you can see the structure changes kind of. This OH group turns to a double bonded O. This OH group turns to an O minus. This group down here becomes a ring, right? And up here, this is kind of an open. It's not a ring anymore. So the concentration of acid base in solution makes this compound change its shape. And depending on the shape of the compound, the sh different shapes have different colors. And so that's what's happening when I add a, an indicator to an acid-base reaction. Adding acid and base changes the shape of the molecule and changing the shape of the molecule changes the color of the molecule. Here's another example, methyl red, where you can see that when uh, the pH is low, the color is dark pink, and as the pH gets higher and higher and higher, the pH kind of turns um, more orange and then different shades of yellow.
So again, depending on where we expect the equivalence point to be in a titration, we can pick an appropriate indicator. Um, and we want an indicator that's going to, to have a very stark change right at the equivalence point, right at the theoretical equivalence point. And again, it's incredibly unlikely we're going to hit that theoretical equivalence point. But if we have a stark change right at that point, it will be much more likely that we'll see that change with our eyes. For example, yellow turning to blue, right? That would be a very easily uh, visually apparent change, whereas red turning to orange would be less obvious, right? So we want an indicator that's going to have a very big visual change right at the pH of the equivalence point. So here is a table with um, different compounds that have and, and their colors at different pHs. So you can see, for example, um, this bromo cresol purple turning from yellow to orange or orange to red, those are harder to see. But turning from red to blue, this would be a pretty obvious change. And this happens right at a pH of about 6.4, 6.5, right? So if our equivalence point was right in the range of 6.4, 6.5, this would be a good indicator because it would go from red to blue, which would be an obvious visual change that we could see with our eyes pretty easily.